Welcome to another one of our videos on the history of North Africa and the Mediterranean. In this video we're going to be touching on giants and megalithic rock formations. But before we do that, I want to just um, read a part of a comment left by a viewer. It says, Canaanites and Phoenicians are just the same people. That's why you're getting tripped up. So thank you for the comment and the advice. And we'll try to keep this in mind so yeah so we don't get tripped up so we're going to be speaking about canaanites and phoenicians let's start with the book of jubilees because it tells us something very interesting about canaan son of ham now it's not the bible it is from the apocrypha but let's um let's see what it says so it says canaan seized palestine wrongfully so you can pause it and read all of this if you'd like to but if i just quickly give you the brief synopsis of this so Canaan didn't like the portion that um, he was supposed to go to, preferred the land of Shem or the land of Lebanon, and even his family warned him not to do it. And he said, if you take the land by sedition, then you'll be rooted up forever. But we're told that you know, Canaan did seize Palestine wrongfully. So I wanted to make you aware of this, if you're not aware of this detail from the Book of Jubilees because you remember in the previous video we were speaking about the Canaanites fleeing to North Africa and according to the you know the Canaanite perspective you know they called Joshua the robber so I said that was interesting because if we now consider the the details from the book of Jubilees you know if this is true that the Canaanites seized Palestine by sedition and that they're going to be rooted out when we start to see that happening maybe in the time of the um, in the time of Joshua, they view the you know the Israelites as robbers, when they were actually the original, um, yeah, taking something that didn't belong to them. So is that showing us the nature of the Canaanites? Let's try and learn a bit more about what these words could mean. So this page tells us that the word Canaan is connected to traffickers, so that could be human traffickers dealing in slaves and you know this idea of being a merchant a merchant people so that does make sense for what we know about the Canaanites and the Bible being connected with being a merchant people one of the strongest connections we have to the meaning of this um, name Canaan and also Phoenicia is the connection with the color red or the color purple and it's connects to this name Canaan with the color purple let me show you where this is coming from. So the Phoenicians were trading in the purple dye and this purple dye was collected from this, uh, from this special shell that we see the picture here. And the royalty used this purple color for their, you know, for their robes or their regalia. So the fact that the Phoenicians had a monopoly on this, on this trade would make them very important. So it could be this uh, this connection with the purple, you know, the purple dye. That could be, um, you know, why we have this connection with these two words. Because it says that, you know, Canaan might have this connection with purple, but so might the word Phoenicia. Because it says the Greeks adopted the name Canaan for this area and called it Phoenicia, a name that has its origin in a Greek word, which also means purple. So the Greeks... So this word Phoenicia coming to us from the Greeks, calling the land of Canaan Phoenicia. So we could have the meaning of the land of purple. So does that um, support what the viewer is saying? That the Canaanites and Phoenicians are the same people. So you could say the land of Canaan or the land of Phoenicia. So does that mean that the Canaanites are also Phoenicians? I'm not sure it's that simple, but maybe we could leave it that way for now until we have something more concrete to um, bring forward if this if it can go against this uh, this uh, the simple explanation of just connecting the Canaanites with the Phoenicians but I just want to share with you my feeling that I'm not sure if it is that straightforward but we'll try be careful and not get tripped up as we go now if we go to the table of nations and the descendants of Canaan so we've already 
mentioned the Gogoshites and the Jebusites in that previous video, and also Sidon, the firstborn of Canaan. In this video, I'd like to speak about the Amorites. And what we're going to look at is how the Amorites may have been depicted on the Egyptian um, depictions, on their reliefs. Okay, so let's read this part. The Amorites, on the contrary, were a tall and handsome people. They are depicted with white skin, blue eyes, and reddish hair, all the characteristics, in fact, of the white race. Mr. Petrie points out that their resemblance to the Dardanians of Asia Minor, who form an intermediate link between the white skinned tribes of the Greek seas and the fair complexioned Libyans of North Africa. So, this part's interesting how it's saying that the Dardanians could be the, the link between the Greek seas and the fair complexioned Libyans. So, if I just remind you about some of those things that we were saying, looking at this history of North Africa, how does it connect to these to the Mediterranean? And we looked at the Sea Peoples, and we did that video. Could it be the Trojans that connect the the Sea Peoples, and then also to the to the Libyans or to the Berbers? So could the Trojans be that link? And now we're looking at the Amorites, and while looking at the Amorites, it brings up the Dardanians. So the Dardanians, just to remind us, named after Dardanus, and we learned that Dardanus was a son of Zeus, who founded the, the Trojan royal line. So we could say Dardanians, but we also, you know, at the same time, we're speaking about the Trojans. So that would be saying that, you know, the Trojans could be this, this link between the Greek, say the Greek world, and the, the Libyan world. So that could be quite important and supports you know some of the things that we've already kind of um, been bringing out with these videos and maybe I should also just read this part out at the start because this could be connected so it says the Hittites and Amorites were therefore mingled together in the mountains of Palestine like the two races which ethnologists tell us go to form the modern cult so now we're having this connection with the Celts so it doesn't say it directly but it seems to be alluding to a potential connection between the Hittites and the Amorites with the, with the Celts. And we're also having this connection with the Dardanians, so the Trojans. So quite a few different elements in this video that we, um, we have to consider. But let's keep going with this uh, source. So now we're speaking about the, um, so the Amorites being compared to the fair complexion Libyans of North Africa. So now we focusing on the Libyans, it says the latter are still found in large number in the mountainous regions which stretch eastward from Morocco and are usually known among the French under the name the Kabyles. The traveller who first meets with them in Algeria cannot fail to be struck by their likeness to a certain part of the population in the British Isles. So this scholar is connecting the Libyans or the Berbers with the, with the Britons, so the British Isles. Their clear white freckled skin, their blue eyes, their golden red hair, and their tall stature remind him of the fair Celts of an Irish village. So this tall stature could be important. We're going to come back to that. So yeah, very, um, very interesting, but also like there's lots of different elements and it's difficult to um, you know, maybe process it to see you know, what's actually being said here. But if we just think about the, the, just the connections at the moment. So now we have the, uh, the Amorites being connected with the with the Libyans of North Africa and the Trojans could be an intermediate link between the Greek world and this you know this uh, Libyan world but now we also have this element of the Celts you know are the Celts a part of this so a connection between North Africa and Britain then it goes on to speak about the, the skulls the long-headed skulls and that these long-headed skulls are found also alongside the these cromlechs. So the practice of building cromlechs. So that's what we're going to speak about now. We said we're um, going to speak about giants and we're going to speak about these megaliths. So I'm still trying to learn as I go with you some of these things, but I think this is what a cromlech is with the you know two pillars and then a, a large slab on top. And it's the practice of you know how they buried the dead, but there could be other reasons and meanings behind these you know these stone circles. 
this is one of the famous most uh, most famous cromlechs in Britain. So who is responsible for these megalithic stone circles? And we have a few potential potentials in this um, source. So you know the Celts, but now we're also thinking maybe about the Amorites, and we're thinking about this tall stature. And we know from the Bible that there were giant kings of the Amorites. So, you know, are these giants with the Amorites connected with these cromlechs? And it speaks about this this race being depicted as um, with freckled skin and blue eyes, all those things that we've read. You know, is this race connected with the, with this culture and this working with megaliths? So yeah, quite a bit of information to try to process, process, but it seems to be speaking about, you know, a people. And if you think about the regions, we see North Africa, and it speaks about Spain coming to France and Great Britain with these megaliths. So there's many different examples of these, you know, these um, cromlechs and these stone circles in different regions. So, you know, who's responsible for this? You know, is it a work of giants and that's obviously what you know the bible does speak about giants in the holy land but um, i think this is some, something that i want to just bring out in this video that we're going to focus on is the dardanians and the trojans and are they the link you know in all this uh with all this that we're looking at okay i want to keep going with the amorites so remember that's the Amorites, yeah, the Amorites that's brought us to this, you know, this information with the, with this connection with the Trojans and the Libyans and the Celts and the, um, the Britons. And we have this idea of the, of the tall stature, but also this fair complexion. And is that why they are um, described as a mountain people? So the, you know, the Amorites described as a, you know, people of the mountains, is it because of their complexion? So we'll speak about that. Okay, so trying to get an idea of this uh, this word Amorite, what could it mean? And there could be different um, theories. We're going to focus on the the theory that's connected with this word Martu. So we do have on the historical records kingdoms and peoples known as the Martu or the Amaru, and scholars connecting that with the biblical Amorites. And you maybe have already seen how I've highlighted here this meaning of Westerners. So is the are the Amorites and this word Martu and Amaru and Amor connected with the idea of you know being in the West or Westerners? And remember thinking that they are you know are people of the are people of the mountains. So I just thought it was interesting when I came across this mountain range called the Amor Range. So it's a part of the Atlas Mountain system in North Africa. So the Amor range. So it just seems that this word could be connected to maybe Amor and the Amorites. So do those details come together with the Amorites being described as a mountain people? And here we have a mountain range called Amor. So a part of the this Atlas Mountain range. And then you start thinking about these words like Morocco, this first part, more for Morocco, you know, is that showing the influence of the Amorites, you know, Amor, son of Canaan? So what we're saying then is we're looking, remember we said that we're just trying to explore as many different elements that we can find first with the Berbers and Libya and this region of North Africa, and then see, does, you know, does the picture start to you know emerge out of that? So then this will be another one for us to consider is the Amorites with the Berbers and North Africa. So the connection that we have is based on appearance for this one. So this is just based on appearance. So according to this scholar, Mr. Petrie, the way the Amorites are depicted is connecting them with the with the Libyans of North Africa. So based on appearance, we have um, a connection with the Berbers and the Amorites and then does it make sense with this idea of their complexion and being a mountain people with this uh, 
and Maud mountain range. But then we do have, um, we do actually have a connection with the tribe. Let me show you this. I know it might be quite small and I can't make it any bigger at the moment, but it says here, there is now a tribe of Berbers near Mekines called Eight Amor, said to be the descendants of the Amorites. So the Eight Amor. So here we have um, a source connecting the Amorites with the Berbers, but it's interesting that it's in this region of, um, let's say, Morocco and this Atlas mountain range. So now we do have a source that is saying that there's a tribe connected to the Amorites in this region. So are these words like Morocco, so this first part, Moor, and could these mountain ranges like the Amor range be connected to the Amorites, the mountain people? And then are the Amorites connected to these, you know, these megalithic structures? And like we said, the Bible does speak about giants in the Holy Land, you know, giants as tall as cedar trees. And there is, um, or there were giant rulers over the Amorites. So I'd just like to finish with this um, quite fascinating detail about the tomb of Antaeus. So Antaeus, well, let me just read this little part out because we're going to finish with this. So it speaks about a Roman general, Quintus Sertorius, in the first century AD. And he was told, well, as he was told, it was the tomb of Antaeus. So he discovered the tomb of Antaeus, a legendary giant who was slayed by the heroic demigod Hercules. So we have spoken about Hercules on this channel quite a bit. But it says the size of this giant was 85 feet. And then he was so struck with horror, so he was so afraid that he immediately covered it again. So another one of these examples where we might not have proof of this, so we're just dealing with an account. But this would be an account of an 85 foot giant in North Africa, in the region of Morocco, in these mountains. And that would definitely be you know, a giant that you could say would be as tall as a cedar tree. So maybe we must take the Bible seriously with what it's saying, you know, when it says there were giants in the earth. And then that might give us a more credible explanation to who was you know, involved with building these, um, these megaliths. So let me know what you think about this video and the information. It's um, quite a lot to consider now because we also have to consider this element of the Celts. So we will try to keep working on these things and exploring them. And the fact that we have the Dardanians mentioned or the Trojans as the, as the let's say it could be the link in all of this. That's very interesting, but who are the Trojans? So we're going to Keep, I think we'll do one or two more videos on the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, you know, to keep seeing what we can learn. But we have to try to see, you know, who are the Trojans? How do they, you know, fit into all of this? So, yeah, thank you for watching this one. If you've got any comments you'd like to share or any feedback, you know, always welcome that. And we'll see you in the next video.